Thank you, Pravina. And on behalf of Chancellor Emeritus and Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs, uh, Dr. Robert Barish, I want to welcome you to today's 11th Annual uh, Minority Health Conference. Um, we had hoped that this conference would have been in person, but because of the events of the pandemic, we're doing this meeting virtually. Um, and one of the um, and and because of that, we're actually seeing greater reach uh, than we had regionally had. So that's a, a blessing. Um, to um, this is going to be part of a series of digital events that we're going to hold over the next several weeks that will focus on minority health uh, inequities as part of this work. I want to specifically thank uh, this. The, the students who were on the planning committee for this conference, and a special thanks to Praveena Babu for her hard work and dedication around the planning of this event. I also want to thank uh, Linda Pineda and Dr. Nadine Peacock for all of their work and dedication and uh, guiding the students as we plan for today's events. Um, you're in for a real treat today. Um, we have an outstanding panel. Uh, Dr. Georges Benjamin, who is the executive director of the American Public Health Association, is going to kick us off. He's also an alum of the University of Illinois at, at Chicago, and he's going to present an overview uh, related to COVID, um, including the national and global impact. Um, we will then have a very interactive panel with three outstanding um, members. Um, who are going to talk specifically about the impact that's going on here in Chicago and specifically the impact on communities of color. Um, so with that, I will um, conclude my opening. Hope you enjoy today's session and turn things over to Dr. Peacock. Thank you, Dr. Giles. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're here for the second time. Um, our sincere apologies to those of you who had to be Subjected to the interruption, we have we soldier on and we will prevail. Um, on behalf of the um, UIC Urban Health Program and the School of Public Health Office of Diversity and Inclusion, again, I want to welcome you all um, and join my fellow um, members of our department and our school in, um, in this, what we hope will be a very um, interesting, interesting event and the first of several as Dr. Giles said. Um, again, I want to join Dr. Giles in thanking our student workers who have been so instrumental um, in getting this uh, underway, as well as our members of our staff um, who have uh, participated in this event, and of course our external partners who are serving as panelists. Um, I think it is um, appropriate that this is event ending up taking place on International Workers' Day. And I think we all should keep in mind all of the essential workers who are helping keep our society going, who are taking care of our health, um, and recognize our obligation to keep them safe. Um, so happy International Workers' Day to everyone. And with that, I'd like to turn things back over to Adina to get us going. Thank you. I think you muted. Okay. She can't. Mm -hmm. We have a, we have a technical difficulty. We have a problem hearing, so we're going to um, we're going to troubleshoot that. But meanwhile, um, I'm going to turn uh, things over to Dr. Georges Benjamin. Mm -hmm. If we can get his slides up. Hold on just a moment. Mm -hmm. Praveen, are you able to speak now? Yes, I just figured it out. Sorry. Okay. So, um, okay. I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Benjamin and get him uh, mm -hmm. start his slides. 
Thank you. I, am, I now welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Georgia Benjamin, the Executive Director of the American Public Health Association, followed by the panelist, Mr. Joseph Harrington, um, who's the president of the Mojo Group, Dr. Aida Giacello, Research Professor of Preventative Medicine at Northwestern University, and Dr. Linda Ray Murray, Clinical Research Professor at UIC School of Benjamin slides are not showing yet. Oh, here we go. Great. Here we go. Perfect. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, th thanks for allowing me to be here with you um, today. And um, um, let's see if we can get them. Can you just do the next slide? Dr. Benjamin, I think you have the control of your slides. Do you want to try to advance? There we go. Thank you. So we're going to obviously talk about the, the COVID-19 coronavirus today. Um, and I just want to point out that we're in a very, very dangerous world uh, today. Um, that, that's our challenge. Um, you can see that there are lots of uh, infectious diseases around, some newly emerging, um, some re-emerging, um, and some that have certainly been a big issue here. And uh, over the years, we've had lots of risks. In fact, over the last 20 years, there hasn't been a year in which the public health community has not been challenged with some type of infectious disease. Uh, and now it's COVID-19, um, um, which is caused by the SARS-2 virus. Talk about a little bit about where it came from. Um, right now, current thinking is it came from a, a, um, a wet market like this. Uh, these are markets where they're open um, food sold. Um, but also live animals um, that are that are handled at these um, these events. So they're kind of butcheries as well as um, places where people buy food, sometimes exotic. And there are many places in the world. It's not just China that have these kind of wet markets. Um, this is a public health issue that needs to be addressed as we go forward. I like to tell people that we have really three epidemics. We have the COVID-19 um, infection we're talking about. We also have an infodemic which is a, an amazing amount of misinformation and disinformation um, that's occurred. Uh, that's particularly important because some of the misinformation and disinformation was targeted to the African-American community. And one of the, the earliest rumors, of course, um, of, of misinformation was the fact that people thought and, and articulated that African-Americans were immune. And of course, we're not. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go forward, further. And then the epidemic of fear, fear of the unknown, um, again, poor risk communications that's happened at a variety of levels, uh, a very rapidly moving communications environment, and quite frankly, some mismanagement by some policymakers with a loss of trust. So let's talk about a little bit of what we know. Um, the coronavirus is part of a family of viruses. Um, the SARS virus we had several years ago was part of this family. MERS, which is a virus that um, was in the Middle East that people actually got from camels. We were very much worried about MERS because it had a very high mortality rate. Um, it never spread, became um, easily to spread, and so we did not see it in large numbers. Um, but in this same family is also the common cold. There are common cold viruses um, that are also in this family. However, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is the one that we're talking about today and that we're most worried about uh, today. This is an RNA virus with a membrane coat. This is a picture of that virus. The little spikes around are um, examples of the, the, the spikes that actually are used to enter the cell. That's the, the, the way that the virus attaches to the membranes in your nose, in your mouth, in your respiratory tree. Um, it's also ultimately going to be probably the antigenic site that people are going to use to take those spikes and actually make a vaccine on them. Um, but this is what the virus looks like. It turns out it's a pretty weak virus. It, it uh, has, a, uh, as I said, a, a membrane coat, which is relatively easily disrupted. 
And there have been studies about how long the uh, virus, um, and they say can live on surfaces. I remind you that a virus really is not a live particle. It is an infectious particle. Um, and even though that we say that it can live in the air for around three hours or in cardboard for 24 hours or in steel or plastic for somewhere around three days, um, that's not necessarily how long it remains infectious. There are a whole lot of things that can impact the infectious nature of the particle, including UV light, including temperature. Um, but it, it is just some sense uh, of how long it is around, uh, particularly for formite spread. Now, the World Health Organization clearly called this a pandemic. And just to remind you that a pandemic means that it's a, a series of big outbreaks, but all around the world. This is a um, a, a relatively up-to-date slide of, of the pandemic. Of those of you who have been watching this picture that the CDC has had on their site for over the last several weeks, um, know that it, it started in Asia and kind of really moved all around the world. And there was at one point uh, a time when there wasn't much of this in Africa, uh, but you can see pretty much that Africa has been pretty much filled out. Also, just to point out, for those of us who, who, are, who are concerned um, that this thing might be more seasonal, we really don't know. Because as you can, as you can see, there, it's all around the world right now into some pretty warm climates. So we have over a million cases. And um, actually, there's no way to keep these maps up to date. So we're now over almost 63,000 deaths in the United States. So let's talk about what we know about the epidemiology. We know that it has a reproductive number of about a little over two. Uh, that means for every person that's infected, they may infect two other people on average. Um, this means it's more infectious than influenza. One of the interesting things is that the early data from China show that about 80% of the cases had relatively mild symptoms, but that that 15 to 20% of people got very, very sick. This is important because as we begin looking at um, that population of people who are very, very sick, they tended to be people with chronic diseases. And I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about that um, because that, that's a very important point, realizing that all populations are at risk. But there certainly seems to be something about this virus that impacts our immune functions that make us um, um, very, very sick when we get it. So right now, the case fatality rate, depending on what part of the world you're looking at, is somewhere between about one and a half and three and a half. We know that it will change as we get a better sense of the denominator, meaning the number of people in that 80% of cases that are not getting sick, because most of these numbers are based on the number of people who got very sick and ended up being hospitalized. And obviously, we know that community transmission is actively occurring in the United States and probably has been doing so for some time. We know that it's transmitted um, primarily through close personal contact, but there is some concerns about an airborne component of this. And that's why we're asking everybody to wear a mask now. Before we thought the pers close personal contact meant that it was just um, respiratory spread um, from someone coughing, sneezing, um, and talking directly um, within a six foot period. But we also now know that there are very, very small particles of this virus um, that, that do get suspended in the air. And so there probably is some airborne suspension and infection. We just don't have a sense on how much of that is. And of course, the fomite infection, usually that's of course someone um, contaminates their hand, usually with coughing or sneezing on it, touches a, a doorknob or a surface, and then someone comes behind them relatively soon, um, picks it up on their hand and then touches their eyes and nose or their mouth. Uh, and therefore transfers the infection to them. Um, obviously, all of these things mean you have to get not just exposed to the virus, but you have to get a reasonably infectious dose to get infected. And we really don't have a good sense yet on what that infectious dose is. I just want to give a sense of the case fatality rate. Um, as I said, it's, it's, it's one and a half to three and a half, but evolving. Um, there are some people who think that this, at the end of the day, this may get to be around the, the Spanish flu. Um, area, uh, but notice the difference between this fatality rate and influenza. This is why people say we should not compare it to influenza, because it is clearly far more ethyl 
lethal than the influenza was. And note that SARS and Ebola were, um, uh, or MERS, were much more in, um, um, dangerous viruses, but um, their ability to transmit person to person was, was highly limited, and therefore, was, so we didn't see it um, um, as we are seeing with uh, uh, the COVID-19 disease. <clears throat> Just to also point out, there's this enormous disparity that we have right now between um, folks, pardon me, um, these, um, so that African Americans um, are, are seeing a much more significant um, um, in, you know, exposure to this virus, and we have more people of color uh, who are dying and getting sick um, disproportionately, just like we have for a variety of other diseases. Um, we think the reason for that, of course, is because um, um, more chronic diseases, health disparities, and more public-facing jobs, so that you have greater exposure overall, um, probably explains some of the disparities we're seeing in this disease. Now, since we don't have a lot of great therapies right now, um, we do use non-pharmacological interventions, which include hand washing, respiratory etiquette, um, physical distancing. You notice I'm using the term physical distancing and not social distancing, um, because I want to make sure people understand we're trying to be physically separate, but we always want to encourage people to be socially cohesive so that we engage one another as we go through this. We've also, of course, had lots of travel um, restrictions, and everybody's living now through a a selective closure of large events and gatherings in some businesses. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we're now talking about using face masks and coverings um, out in the community. The ultimate goal, of course, everybody's familiar with this, this curve now. Um, it's amazing how quickly the, the whole world got to learn a little bit of epidemiology and public health. Um, the goal is to go take the brown curve and make it look more blue by flattening that curve and spreading out the cases over time. Uh, we give our health system the capacity to be able to manage the outbreak. Um, we also may have less cases uh, if we do that as well. And I just thought that this was a great picture because it, it clearly shows uh, the concept with just one look of what the physical distancing um, ultimately looks like when you simply break that cycle of contagion. The question is, does it work? So here's, the, here's an, an example of the 1918 um, uh, influenza. Uh, Philadelphia was a little late in doing the uh, physical distancing, and St. Louis wasn't. Um, and so Philadelphia had a, a, a terrible outbreak, and St. Louis had less of one. Uh, and we saw this all over the nation. The early adopters of social distancing um, resulted in less morbidity, less mortality, less sick people. Their health systems were able to handle it better in those communities that did not. Uh, tragically, we've had um, a variance in access to protective gear. Um, we've had these terrible stories of people having to make up stuff um, to uh, um, uh, cover themselves, including um, taking masks home and doing things that the medical system would never have tolerated just four months ago. And they had this whole issue of um, the differences between the N95 mask that has to fit very snugly on your face, and of course the surgical mask that even some of our health providers are using. I just want to point out that surgical mask, um, as you can see, it doesn't give you a firm fit, and so you can actually breathe around it. It may protect you if you're infectious from coughing out particles in somebody else's face, but the fact that when you inhale, the air comes around that mask, um, you're much more likely to get um, anything that's in the air brought into your, your lungs and your nose um, when you breathe around with a surgical mask. And that's why we're encouraging people, of course, and particularly in the healthcare system, to use N95 masks. Uh, and then the, the infamous cotton mask, um, which um, people are wearing, which is, which is an important mask um, to do. And again, it's, it's, it will protect others from you if you're infection, infectious. We're not real clear about how much it, it protects you um, but people are, are looking at that now, and there, there are some studies looking at the cotton mask. Um, and then I have to deal with the whole issue of masking while black. Obviously, um, profiling continues to be a challenge in the African-American community. Um, 
And I just encourage folks, recognize we shouldn't wear masks when we're outdoors, um, but we have to use common sense. And so I would encourage people to, to have the mask in their hand, put it on their forehead, but I'm, I'm unlikely to go into a bank um, masked. I will mask when I get in the bank, but I'm very, very likely, unlikely to walk in there that way or any other condition in which I will be profiled and presumed to be hostile simply because of the way I look. And the whole issue of testing. So um, testing for the virus uh, uses nasal and oral swabs. Um, they um, manually take four to five hours to process. And then of course, wherever you have to send them to use your process, there are automated tests that can do it um, certainly within an hour. They're now looking at some quick tests that um, are available, um, but those, those still need to be properly validated. Um, we're still a big problem with access to tests, although that is getting better. Um, and we now have these new antibody tests. Now, in both cases, um, the, the tests are um, presumed that you're, once you've been infected or once you've had the antibody, that it presumes immunity. We don't know that yet. Um, immunity tests are ongoing, but we're not sure whether or not people are actually immune, and more importantly, how long you're immune for. But that's important because there's a lot of people relying on these antibody tests right now. And again, it doesn't imply that you are, um, um, you've been exposed, but again, it doesn't necessarily imply that you're gonna be immune. We, we know there are lots of reasons for these um, in, in, in inequities in terms of testing. There have been inequities in testing, um, access to testing, differences in the quality of tests that are out there. As you know, they're just, there, there, are, there are many, many, many tests out there. Many of them have not been validated by the FDA. Um, there are some shysters out there that are promoting um, um, tests that are not proper, that have not been properly validated, that have real um, negative predictive values. They don't have good um, um, understanding of what the um, false positive and false negative rates are. So that, that's a, train, a challenge for people um, who are getting these tests. Uh, and then obviously behavioral differences in how people view tests. We still have a community, particularly the African-American community and the Hispanic community, they don't necessarily trust the system. So that's, that's a challenge for us. And we have to convince people that if they go to a trusted source, that the test is in, something important to do, that they can't get infected by having the test. Um, and that while the test may be uncomfortable, particularly when you put a nasal swab in someone's nose, um, it is something that we should do to try to understand the test. And then, of course, the social determinants, the fact that um, we still hear stories of these testing sites not being in communities of color, being too far away from people, um, that you have to take two buses and walk a few blocks to get there. Um, if it's a drive-by drive testing and you don't want to drive a car, you can't get to the testing site. Those kinds of things remain a challenge, um, just like other issues in the um, communities of color. So, Let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I talked about the location and mode of testing of these facilities, um, but I also wanted to point out the issue of the messaging for a gateway provider. Initially, we told people, call your doctor, call your healthcare provider. Well, if you don't have a doctor um, as your primary uh, or your healthcare provider or your doctor's closed, then um, um, that's a challenge for us, um, trying to get to someone. And people have had to play, um, chase the test. So they call the doctor, even when they have one, the doctor says they don't have the test, call the health department. They call the health department, the health department tells them, we don't have the test, call your doctor. Um, and people have gotten that runaround. Um, uh, and that's been a real challenge for many people getting tests. The cost of testing, even though it's, it's a federal test and there's federal coverage for now, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that the other parts of the clinical engagement are covered. Uh, and then of course, if you're uninsured or underinsured, that becomes an, an, an additional barrier uh, for you to getting care, even if you're positive. Um, we talked a bit about the, the quality of the tests, um, but I just wanna encourage people that we have to ensure that we have a reliable test. Um, so whoever's using these tests, they have to be sure they're reliable and it's consumer beware out there right now. Too many of us are concerned about stigma. Um, you know, you have fear of discovery. Um, you know, the person who 
is concerned about getting cancer um, and knowing they have cancer, even though they probably think they do, they've got rectal bleeding. We see the same phenomenon with COVID. People who, who think they may have COVID, but they really don't want to know because it's a fear of discovery, a uh, fear of stigma. You know, if I have, um, if I know I have it, I can't work. So I'm, I really don't want to know so I can legitimately say, um, I, I don't know that I'm infected, therefore I can show up to work. Um, and again, we mentioned the lack of trust in the system. Um, and then I just want to add to, to my previous comments on the social determinants to talk about paid sick leave um, being an issue. Obviously, if you don't uh, have paid sick leave and you don't work, you don't get paid, you don't get paid, you don't have the resources you need to manage your life or your family. Um, that's an issue. And while the emergency department for many of us has been a safety net, Right now, it's not a place to go specifically just for testing. Uh, it's crowded, there are high costs, and there's a risk of going to the health system today because you may very well, um, if you're not infected, um, if you don't properly protect yourself, you do run the risk of getting exposure. And obviously, racial and ethnic bias in testing continues to be a challenge. Um, we don't understand all the implications behind that. Um, there are lots of scattered stories about people being turned away. And people, of course, assuming it was because of who they were and what they looked like. I do want to bring your attention to an interesting study. Um, Los Angeles uh, decided to do a randomized study. They took, they went out for a thousand people that um, um, had a proprietary database of the county's population. They did a rapid antibody test. The rapid antibody test is a test that shows that you have been um, infected and exposed to the virus. Um, presumably, you're no longer infected. Um, and in their tests, they said they validated it, and it had a 90 to 95% accuracy rate, which was validated by an outside lab. Um, and with that test, um, it was a drive-through test, so you had to be well enough to get in the car and actually drive through. Um, they found um, that approximately 4% of their population in San Francisco, and I'm um, sorry, in Los Angeles was positive. Um, which was interesting because it meant that somewhere it was around 220 to 440,000 adults um, had that uh, infection at the time that they did the study, far less than the city had estimated at the time the, the prevalence rate of the disease was in the community. Um, and that, again, that's important because they're beginning to get some understanding of the denominator. Uh, New York, by the way, has done a similar type of study looking at antibodies. And they have found as much as, on average, 20% of the people in the state of New York probably have already been exposed to the disease. Now, assuming that this, this, these antibody tests are picking up COVID, um, um, SARS-2, the disease that causes COVID-19, um, that means that a substantial part of the population, um, or more so than we thought, were covered, but far less than we need for herd immunity, 4% and 20% of people exposed in an environment which you need is 70% of the population to be covered to get herd immunity. Um, so we know, we know we're as near that um, to be important. The other thing about this Los Angeles study was that a substantial number of people, uh, particularly African-Americans and proportionally were positive. So they had 6% uh, of the men were positive. So they were also African-American men. Um, and uh, you can see only 7% of, of, of the whites were positive. Um, so there was a disproportionate number of African Americans um, that were positive in this particular study. Um, we don't understand um, why these risks occurred. Um, the fact that um, um, African American men were higher in terms of the, the, the antibody positivity, but again, I think it tells us that um, because they're public facing, most likely that's the explanation for the positivity rate. Let's also talk about some solutions, um, at least in terms of trying to get test equity. Um, we need to make sure that we have these tests available in um, communities of color so that people e can easily get to them, that we deal with the, some of the cost issues, um, that everybody, again, is making sure they have an approved test, um, that we use the communications tools that we have to make sure they're culturally competent, um, that we use trusted messengers. This has become much more of an issue when we start doing contact tracing. Um, and on the long term, we need to begin addressing the social determinants to the extent that we can make testing easier 
um, but providing um, easy transportation um, uh, as a minimum for people to get these tests. We also have to begin thinking about therapeutic interventions um, because right now it's, it's basically general supportive care. We do know that there are vaccines in development. You're hearing lots of stories about when these vaccines will be ready. Um, I continue to say 12 to 18 months before the vaccines are ready. They are trying to do some innovative ways to fast track it. We'll see. Um, but at the end of the day, we're hoping that, of course, whoever gets the vaccine, there is this equitable access to the vaccine. Also, that there are lots of randomized controlled styles going on for antiviral agents. And there is some ev early evidence that at least one of the antiviral agent, viral agents reduces the amount of time that somebody is sick and they can be discharged in the hospital. So it serves like a basis for other studies. And again, the whole issue is making sure that people have equal access to those antiviral agents once they're available. Um, you have also seen studies of using antibody-rich plasma uh, for people who are very sick. Right now, that's pretty much being used on, under experimental conditions, um, but it does seem to provide some protection for people. Well, let's see. I mentioned the fact that we had this um, epidemic that we had to address. Um, it, it's important for us to really get and deal with facts, speaker communication, correct misinformation, disinformation right away. Um, in other words, in, in other words, to build trust. That, that, that's a real problem, and we continue to have problems with that even today. There's still some things we don't know. We don't know the true mortality rate. Um, we don't know whether it's going to be seasonal or come and come back next year. It, it probably will be endemic, but we don't know for sure. We don't know all the ways it's spread. Interestingly enough, we don't know a lot about its effect on pregnant women and fetuses. Um, so far, there doesn't seem to be a lot of impact, but that remains to be seen. Um, children have an overall lower mortality rate. Again, we don't know what that is, and we don't know the role of kids as carriers. Um, those two questions absolutely have to be answered if we're going to um, return our community to normal. As you know, we've had multiple system failures to date, um, including um, poor and confused leadership, uh, lots of technical failures early on with the tests. We know that as we begin to ramp up, we have understaffed public health departments, uh, under practiced emergency responders, that we had lots of plans for pandemic plans, but they actually sat um, on the shelf. Um, we, of course, have this fractured healthcare delivery system um, with far too many people underinsured and uninsured in our nation. Um, and you'll hear about, oh, wonderful things happening in other nations, um, like, like, um, like Sweden, um, which, of course, has universal health care for all of its citizens um, and universal long-term care for all of its citizens, um, that um, is still challenged with um, a high death rate in, per capita in their country. But they're not dealing with a lot of the social determinant aspects of people being out of work as we are doing here. So how do we know when it's time to go back? I agree with Dr. Fauci that the virus is going to drive this decision, <clears throat> that the reopening requires us to have a, a competent health system that can manage problems that we have and, and being on the down curve uh, of the number of new cases and, um, and deaths, um, having a robust testing infrastructure, both to do, deal with infections and do disease surveillance, to have adequate contact tracing through the state and local health departments and linked to the state and local health departments and the ability to isolate and quarantine um, through the contact tracing efforts that we have. Um, the future holds, um, I think very clearly, we still operate in an incongruent environment where the crisis happens, the funding comes too late, um, and then the performance on the health system and public health system far exceeds both the money and the crisis. We got to fundamentally fix that. Um, I believe that the blueprint means that the public health system clearly needs to become 
the chief health strategist, that we build cross-sector partnerships that are vibrant, that we have a timely, actionable data system, which we really don't have right now, um, that we can deliver all 10 of the essential services um, with, that is adequately funded and in a sustainable way and has accountable systems and leadership. Um, we have certainly seen this before in 1918. Uh, in fact, the American Public Health Association uh, was around then. And um, I tell people that we had our annual meeting then, but we, um, for physical distancing purposes, moved it from its time in September to December in order to uh, align ourselves with what was happening in the nation. Um, and they, these are resources that I think trusted. People are always asking me what are some trusted resources. And obviously, I like to think the APHA website is a trusted resource. Um, yes, CDC botched in many ways the initial test rollout, but they've got amazing stuff on their website, and they are still a trusted resource uh, as far as I'm concerned, as is, of course, the World Health Organization. Uh, and then let me just close by, by, by a quote from one of my more favorite quotes from Martin Luther King, that nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. And I got to tell you that we have far too much of this um, going on in our nation today. With that, I'll stop. And I guess I turn it over to the panel. Hey, Dr. Benjamin, there are actually a few questions. Okay. Them. The, first one, the first one is, um, what are your thoughts on the idea that symptoms are presented differently in people of color, like many other health issues? Yeah, I don't think we know, I don't, I don't think we know um, the, the differences in presentation of disease yet. I don't think anyone's done any real good studies of that. Um, having, having said that, we do know that there is variance in symptomatology. Uh, for sure. Um, we've had uh, everyone initially focused on the respiratory symptoms, you know, stuffy nose, fever, um, cough. Um, CDC has added to that list, uh, um, I'm sorry, shortness of breath. CDC has added to that list um, loss of taste, um, for sure. They've added to that list um, some GI symptoms. Um, we know that there is a um, probably some kind of autoimmune system. Um, symptoms and, and, and signs that are going on with some rash, particularly in kids, some um, um, blue toe um, things like you get with um, uh, um, cold um, antigens that people can produce. Um, we also know that um, there's uh, some kind of coagulopathy that occurs um, because we've seen people with um, um, clotting and pulmonary embolism that have actually happened. So we know there are different symptoms for sure, whether or not they're, um, they show up differently in different race or ethnicities. I don't think we know yet. Thank you. Um, the next question was, <coughs> so this is what this um, attendee city, but they said, I also feel as if the black community is sort of being ignorant to the pandemic and not taking the proper precautions to avoid infecting themselves and other people. Um, an example is the party that was on the west side, and they surely know what is going on around in the world. Um, they added that on top of that, African Americans really don't get proper health care in the first place, and we know that the virus is more deadly to people with pre-existing health conditions. Yeah, that's no, no true, that we're, we're at greater risk. So if we, you know, we're, we're at greater risk because we're public facing, so greater exposure for many of our populations, particularly African Americans, bus drivers, grocery store clerks, people in the service industry, sanitary, sanitarians um, are much more at risk, of course, because they're out and about. Um, secondly, we have to um, um, deal with this whole issue of um, the fact when you have more chronic diseases, particularly at an early age, then you're much more likely when you get, if you get infected, to get sicker and possibly die sooner because of that. And we are seeing that both in the prevalence of disease in the African-American community and both the morbidity and mortality um, that we're seeing. Thank you. Our next question is, um, if you have any information about masks with the PM 2.5 filter inserts and their effectiveness. I, I don't know. Um, you know, the, um, 
I, there are there are a lot of studies that are being done in terms of um, looking at the size of the organism, trying to better understand. I think right now most people think the N95 mask is effective, um, but again, it remains to be seen. The next question is if you know whether people with thrombophilias are at increased risk. Say it again, people with? Um, thrombophilias? Probably thrombophobitis. Oh, yes, sorry. That's okay. Um, and and um, obviously, thrombophobitis is inflammation of the, of, the, of the veins in the lower leg in particular. Um, and so there is a propensity of people with thrombophobitis to get deep vein thrombosis. And so you now have a thromb thrombolytic or a thrombotic uh, condition. Um, I, w I, don't, I can't tell you for sure, but just it is quite possible that anybody that has any kind of autoimmune um, activity, increased inflammatory activity, may very well be more at risk of getting um, um, their immune system to become hyperactive. And one of the things we know that has killed many of these patients is because they've had just simply a, a, um, an a immune um, overload where their immune system just gets hyperactive and um, has resulted in many people dying. And this one of the challenges is a lot of people are there doing okay for the first week, and then the second week, they basically crash and get much sicker. The next question is, um, So it says, what can we do currently to help increase the importance of social distancing to minority communities, given the recent examples in Chicago um, showing minorities at large numbers? Yeah, I think we have to continue to, 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 to do trusted messengers to tell folks, look, you're not immune. Um, you've got to, even, even if you have to go to work, you need to do so in a safe manner. So that means spreading on the bus. That means wearing your mask. That means um, washing your hands frequently. That means when you're on the job, still doing frequent hand washing, having a hand sanitizer in your pocket. I know they were, there was a shortage early on, and, um, um, but trying to get a hold of them so that you can, um, you can use that when you can't wash your hands, covering up your nose and mouth when you cough or sneeze. And um, you know, if you're a healthcare worker, um, to the extent you can decontaminate yourself before you leave the office, that would be helpful. Um, you know, leaving your shoes out and not tracking them around the house. Um, will be helpful. And many of us, of course, live in multi-generational homes and may not have the space and the ability to do the kind of physical distancing we recommend. And you have to just do the best you can with that. Um, just going on from that question, um, I think this there was another question related to that, but it talks about <clears throat> what kind of messaging should happen and who needs who does who does it need to come from in order to reach these minority communities? Yeah, I, 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 you know, during the HIV AIDS epidemic, we learned a lot uh, about the importance of the trusted messengers, uh, people that look like them, uh, people that are from the community. I, I can tell you that when I was in health office in Washington, D.C., um, we had a massive education campaign for barbers, beauticians, um, um, faith um, ministers um, um, in town, the faith community, so that they could, A, be properly educated. Because anybody um, that goes into the barbershop that I go into, there's a lot of, lot of stuff talk, a lot of smack talked in that barbershop. And a lot of information gets passed on. Some of it is real, some of it is, some of it is misinformation. Um, but if you can give that trusted messenger um, those messages, um, they will share that message uh, about the, about, and you know, diffuse some of the myths that are out there. But it requires a conscious effort. It also means using places where people go. So today, the youth use YouTube and Twitter and a variety of social tools that, that I'm still trying to figure out how to use. Um, but there's also radio. And you also have to talk to people in the language in which they're used to hearing. So if English is not their first language, um, then we need to make sure that we're speaking in a variety of languages. And I know the health departments of our nation are used to, to putting out materials in 12, 13, 14, sometimes 20 languages depending on, you know, the, what the community is that they're serving. The next question is, um, is how do we address the issue of people who are unsafe in their homes due to the stay at home order? Um, and specifically, they're asking about domestic violence, child abuse victims, and people exposed to lead poisoning in their homes. 
Yeah, um, one of the challenges is when we, when we put all of ourselves together, even, the, you know, we, we perpetuate the existing violence that's already occurring in those communities. And then we also run the risk of increasing it as people, people get challenged. They're um, not able to cope um, and they can be compensated. And so child abuse goes up, uh, child neglect too. Um, domestic violence um, goes up. And I think it means that the social service community um, certainly has a step up his game. But quite frankly, there's a responsibility for all of us to do that. Checking on our neighbors, checking on our loved ones is going to be very important as part of um, trying to reduce the, the violence and abuse. Um, it, it's going to be extremely important. Making sure that um, not that the kids are home, um, that if you have a gun in the home, that you secure that weapon properly. Um, because the kids are now around much, much more, and they got a lot, a lot of time to get into things. Um, the next question is: Is um, if you know of any resources, such as any websites or any written resources with information that instructs how to improve their use of the masks that they have. Um, so, if people have either cotton masks, like just how to improve the effectiveness of it. Yeah, I think the thing is that the CDC has some information on its website on how to um, how to make a mask, and there are a lot of little videos out there on YouTube that people are how to make masks. Uh, I think the important thing is to properly cover the nose and the mouth um, so that it's comfortable and make sure it's, it's, it, it wraps around basically the whole part of your nose and your face um, is, is a way to properly wear that mask. Um, <clears throat> realizing that um, you do need to wash it frequently and, uh, um, and wear it anytime you're, you're within six feet of someone um, is, is going to be very, very important to wear that mask. I think we're near the last two questions, um, but it says, is it time to consider creating a similar trusted <clears throat> organization like the NAACP for the civil rights movement in order to begin this health civil rights conversation in the African-American community? Or is there an organization now that can do that? Well, I, I, I know for a fact that, that now in the middle of disaster, not to start, time to start building and stuff. Um, I can tell you that the NAACP has been very active in this discussion. Um, many of our in the Urban League, um, many of the organizations that have traditionally served um, our communities um, um, have, have been very actively involved. And quite frankly, the American Public Health Association is um, one of our major tenants um, is, um, is health equity. And we've been very, very much um, doing this. You also have the Black Caucus of Health Workers, which is a public health group that is very is affiliated with the American Public Health Association. Um, but it was totally dedicated to um, ensuring health equity. Um, there's a Council of Black Health um, that um, um, Shariki Kumanichi from University of Pennsylvania is very active. And I guess he's at Drexel now, um, has um, um, been very active involved, and they are another organization dedicated to addressing this. The um, Black Women's Health Initiative, um, the president, Linda Blount, um, is another organization. So we have a, we have a, several African American organizations um, that we can rally around. Um, I think the the biggest issue though is not just the health part, is that we have to once and for all deal with these social determinants as well. Um, and obviously NAACP and other groups like that that are that are trying to address the social determinants. I, I think we need to rally around them and help them um, help us uh, address this epidemic in a much broader way than just the um, just the just the health issues. Thank you. And the last question is, how do we aid in protecting our homeless population who have no shelter to shelter in place? Yeah, we've got to, we got to, we got to step up more to the homeless group. And, and increasingly, um, they're now beginning to go out and communities are now beginning to test the homeless. Um, those that, are, that, are, that require um, sheltering because they're sick or because they are um, sick, sick enough not to be in the hospital, but um, but um, but positive with virus are being um, now put into settings um, in many places, hotels, um, to to shelter them, and then some of the other homeless folks are working very hard to get them off the street. But as you know, that's a very very difficult population um, to to get off the street for a variety of reasons, um, and you have to make sure that you don't create some of the very violent um, issues that they see when you put these folks together. Um, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a conjugate setting, um, you do see violence, you do see sexual assault, 
Um, sometimes when you put those folks together in a conjugate setting, uh, and you also have to maintain good infection control. So if you're not going to do it right, um, um, it, 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 you continue, you can put those individuals at risk while you're trying to help them. I think that's it for questions. Um, I would like to thank you for being part of the conference today. <coughs> and I know everyone enjoyed um, the presentation today. Thank you so well, much. I think, and I thank you very much. And I'm going to certainly listen in as, as much as this as I can. Uh, I know that Ada, Dr. Gasselio has a great presentation and I know uh, as as uh, as uh, the Joe Harrington, uh, so I will try to listen to. I've got to get off at 12:30, but I will absolutely listen to as much as I can. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And Thank I'm you. glad to have been have the opportunity to be on here. And up next, we'll have our panelists speaking. Mr. Harrington. Got to unmute. Yes. Perfect. Um, do you see your slides? Uh, I see Aida's slides. Okay. But mine are, mine are coming up now. Yeah, I see my slides. You do. Okay. And I think I think I still have control. You have to take control from me. Okay. I will send the control over to him. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, I, I want to uh, begin by thanking the. Uh, University of Illinois School of Public Health, uh, their Office of Diversity and Inclusion for uh, giving me the opportunity to be a part of this August group of leaders and educators. I also want to uh, commend and acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Dr. Benjamin, uh, Dr. Giacello, and uh, Dr. Murray, uh, who I count as friends as well as colleagues. And uh, they're part of this programming and uh, I want to commend them as well for overcoming the hurdles they face to be and the roles they're in today while remaining true to who they are and serving as a voice for the voiceless. Um, I'm not going to use any numbers during my presentation. Uh, the numbers of infected and dying from COVID-19 are changing daily. Uh, my goal is to promote a context of disparities we're seeing in African Americans. Uh, my opening slide, which you can see, contains a quote by Dr. Benjamin Mays, uh, which he made during a speech. It was a Founders' Day address at Shaw University in 1965. Dr. Mays was an African-American Baptist minister, civil rights leader, and served almost 30 years as the sixth president of Morehouse College. He's credited with laying the, uh, the intellectual foundations of the civil rights movement, and taught and mentored many influential activists, including the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Julian Bond, Maynard Jackson, among others. His quote references the great race of life. And this is a concept I'll address later in my remarks. In an April 3rd article by Akila Johnson and Talia Buford, they write, environmental, economic, and political factors have compounded for generations putting black people at higher risk of chronic conditions that leave lungs weak and immune systems vulnerable, asthma, heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes. Uh, however, I respectfully disagree with the use of the term and the word generations, and I've written about that before. I believe that history is a prelude to the future. So what we're seeing now in terms of the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on African-Americans was highly predictable. Therefore, my focus is not on numbers you already know, but on the history behind those numbers. And now I'm going to change slides. And again, I'm going to provide a historical context of what we're seeing today. Uh, John Adams was among the founding fathers of our country and an active member of the Continental Congress. In May of 1776, he helped frame our nation's Declaration of Independence. So I think it's important for us to reflect on these lofty and eloquent words which he helped craft. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, 
that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The use of the word men in that statement has long been a source of debate. Some say that it was a euphemism, a veiled reference to humanity, while others claim that it was used in a more exclusive manner. In a letter dated March 13, 1776, prior to the final version of the Declaration of Independence, Abigail Adams wrote to her husband, John Adams, to say the following. I long to hear that you have declared an independency and by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would make the ladies, you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. So it appears that the use of men may not have included women, especially since they were denied the right to vote until the 19th Amendment was passed by Congress on June 4th, 1919, granting them the right to vote. So did slaves count because slavery was in effect at that time as well. Last year, our nation commemorated the 400th anniversary of slavery in America. As Henry Louis Gates Jr. describes in Life Upon These Shores, looking at African-American history 1530 to 2018, and this is a quote from his book, the history of African-American people in what is now the United States began in August of 1619, when the first cargo of 20 and odd Africans aboard an English ship called the White Lion landed in Jamestown, Virginia. He goes on to write, Americans tend to forget that the slave trade to the New World was already a century old by the time it began in the United States in 1619, a year before the Mayflower landed on Plymouth Rock. And as Jesse Jackson once famous, famously said, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on us. And in a strange twist of irony, as our founding fathers were writing the country's constitution, they faced a significant dilemma. Among the thorny questions debated by the delegates of the 1787 Constitutional Convention, and one of the hardest to resolve was how to elect the president. This was a subject of great debate for several months. Some argued that Congress should pick the president, while others insisted on a Democratic popular vote. Their compromise is known as the Electoral College. One of the things that made this such a desirable compromise was the fact that during this time, roughly 40% of people living in Southern states were slaves who couldn't vote. And in Virginia, Slaves accounted for 60% of the entire population. Thus, a direct presidential election or one with electors divvied up according to free white residents only wouldn't fly in the South. The solution was and remains controversial. It was a three-fifths compromise, which determined that slaves would be counted as three-fifths of a person for the purposes of allocating representatives and electors and calculating federal taxes. The compromise ensured that the southern states would ratify the Constitution and gave Virginia, home to more than 200,000 slaves, a quarter of the total electoral votes to win the presidency. So while slaves were indeed counted, they were not considered men. Fast forwarding a bit, my first slide quoted the words of Dr. Benjamin Mays. He who starts behind in the great race of life must forever behind, remain behind or run faster than a man in front. This same phrase, race of life, was actually used by Abraham Lincoln in a speech he gave in New Haven on March 6, 19, 1860, the year before he became president. Here's an excerpt. When one starts poor, as most do in the race of life, Free society is such that he knows he can better his conditions. He knows that there is no fixed condition of labor for his whole life. I am not ashamed to confess that 25 years ago, I was hired as a laborer, mauling rails at work on a flat boat. Just what might happen to any poor man's son. I want every man to have the chance, and I believe a black man is entitled to it. 
in which he can better his condition when he may look forward and hope to be a hired laborer this year and the next, work for himself afterward, and finally to hire men to work for him. So it appears that there was this idea that blacks should and could receive equal rights and, and have the equal opportunity that others had. And on November 19, 1863, on a battlefield near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, he gave what is considered the greatest speech of his presidency. He opened by saying, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. A proposition that while invoked had yet to be realized by all, women didn't, didn't still have the right, the right to vote and African-Americans were just coming out of slavery. Further, the Emancipation Proclamation was effective January 1st, 1863. Yet it was not enforced in Texas until after the Confederacy collapsed Juneteenth was established as a holiday for African Americans. It commemorates the June 19, 1865 announcement of the abolition of slavery in Texas and more generally the emancipation of enslaved African Americans throughout the former Confederate States of America. Following the Civil War, a series of Jim Crow laws which were, were enacted at state and local levels throughout the country to legalize racial segregation. Named after a black show uh, character, these laws existed for about 100 years from the post-Civil War era until 1968. They were designed specifically to marginalize African-Americans and not deny them the right to vote, hold jobs, get an education, and other opportunities. Those who attempted to buy them often faced arrests, fines, jail sentences, violence, and death. We're going to fast forward to 1915. 105 years ago, in April of 1915, National Negro Health Week began. It was organized in response to findings by the Tuskegee Institute that highlighted the poor health status of African-Americans in the early part of the 20th century. At a session of the Tuskegee Negro Conference in 1914, founder of the Tuskegee Institute, Booker T. Washington, presented data which showed economic, the economic costs of poor health status of the black population in the United States. Paul Brath, in his recent article in the Journal of the American Public Health Association, moving from National Negro Health Week to National Public Health Week in the United States, pointed out the following, which is not too different than what we see today. In the early 20th century, like today, African Americans had poor health than their white counterparts. However, the health discrepancy was more pronounced. The laws of the Jim Crow South, combined with less formal hiring, and residential restrictions in the North to confine the majority of African Americans to the lowest paid jobs and the worst, most crowded accommodations. Such conditions contributed to African Americans suffering from and dying at a higher rate than whites for almost all diseases. Physicians primarily practice in the cities. Most African Americans live in rural areas. Uh, I'm going to close, but before I do, I want to share some resources that I used in developing uh, my talks and my remarks. Uh, one is Life Upon These Shores, Looking at African American History, 1513 to 2018 by Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Another is a Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present by Harriet A. Washington. Another is an American Health Dilemma, a Medical History of African Americans and the Problems of Race, beginning, 
of race, beginning since 1900 by Linda A. Clayton and W. Michael Byrd. And the last is Unequal Treatment, Confronting Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare, National Academies Press. So those are some resources I think uh, and encourage you to take a look at. Uh, and I'm gonna go to my last slide. And so I want to leave you uh, with the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. But I also want to reference a quote from his final book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, which was published after his untimely and premature death. And this is what he wrote. Why is equality so assiduously avoided? Why does white America delude itself and how does it rationalize the evil it retains? The majority of white Americans consider themselves sincerely committed to justice for the Negro. They believe that American society is essentially hospitable to fair play, steady, and fair play, steady, steady and growth, steady growth, and steady. I'm sorry, committed is essentially hospital to fair play and steady growth toward a middle class utopia embodying racial harmony. But unfortunately, this is a fantasy of self deception and comfortable vanity. I submit to you that COVID 19 did not create the conditions which resulted in the disproportionate rates of mortality among African Americans. The barriers to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness for all are historic, systematic, and structural. And unless everyone in this country has an equal opportunity, regardless of race, sex, gender orientation, religion, and country of origin, have the opportunity to, to get an equal opportunity to have a good quality of life and good quantity of life, we are destined to perpetrate the sins of the past leading to significant gaps in income, which cause again, lower life expectancy and a reduced quality of life. This is our great challenge, to level the playing field in the great race of life. We can make a difference individually and collectively. I invite you to join my colleagues and me in taking on that challenge. So as I close, I want to leave you with a statement from the Reverend. I want to leave you with a statement and, and end my remarks with this quote by Frantz Fanon, the author of Black Skin's White Mask. Each generation must, out of obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or portray it. I discovered my mission and encourage you to discover yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Harrington. Um, we're gonna have questions in the end. So for all of the attendees, would you mind just um, in the chat feature, um, direct where the, or who the question is supposed to be for and then type your question after that, thank you. And then next we'll have um, Dr. Giacello. Can everybody see me and hear me? Yes, Dr. Chichilla, we okay. can. Thank you. Great, so you're gonna be uh, placing my slides there, right? Yes. Okay, so while she does that, I just wanna thank each one of you for attending this um, WebEx uh, conference. And I really want to also echo what Joe say about congratulating the organizing of this, of the organizer of this important event. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into planning and making sure that the technology and everything is in place. So I'm going to be speaking this morning, or I guess this afternoon almost, uh, about the experience of COVID-19 in the Latino population. And I know my slides are not there yet. Um, so if, while they put them in the display, in the screen, I just want to say that as a Puerto Rican, I speak fast. 
and I go faster when I have a lot to say in a period of time. But the main objective of my presentation is actually to be able to give you an understanding of what's happening with the Latino community in terms of COVID-19. What are some of the most recent data is indicating in terms of infection? And then be able to explain some of the many underlying conditions uh, that are responsible for the disparity that we are now seeing in people of color in terms of the COVID-19 infection and hospitalization. And in that process, uh, I'm gonna end by explaining some of the action. As many of you may know about me, I'm a, I mean, I, I consider myself an activist. <laughs> Actually, I've been trained as a community organizer. So every opportunity to mobilize community and to be able to take the opportunity to address issues of social justice, that's where I am at. And so right now I'm gonna be at the end uh, giving you an overview about some of the work that the Latino leadership, including elected officials are doing right now. And you probably have seen more articles than ever in the media about the COVID-19 and the impact on Latino. And the reason for that is because we have been putting press release every single day. I've been spending half of my day in, in interviews in radio and TV and, and, and newspaper. And as a result, we are trying to bring public attention because people don't believe, including the same Latino community, that we have a serious problem, and we do. And that would be the argument that I would try to make this day. So, Provina, if you could be able to change the slide, I would appreciate it. So, I already explained to you the objective. Go to the next one, please. Else, just to put it into perspective, some key facts about Latinos. You know, there's 60 million Latinos living in the United States, representing about 18 or 19 percent of the total population. With the new, with the census coming up, the result we hope to be very clear about exactly where we are. But prediction that were done in, in 2010 already said that we will be close to 20 percent of the U.S. population. In Illinois. We have about a total of 2.1 million, representing also similar percentages in regard to the Illinois population. And in Chicago, we represent about 30% of the city population as well. The average age is slightly about 27, it's slightly lower than for other racial and ethnic groups. And about 23% of Latino are considered individual living below poverty level. Now, uh, because Latinos have a high work ethic, they represent about 70% to 80% in their participation in the labor market. And this is one area that has really, in terms of hardship, economic hardship has been extremely uh, uh, painful in terms of the experience that we see in the Latino community as well as other poor community and, and vulnerable population. And due to large family size and low salary, they work most of the time in two jobs, and now they cannot do that, or they are still working long hours, and we're going to elaborate that next. Um, the next slide, please. So here is uh, some of the cases up to April 29. I tried to have an update <clears throat> for this day, but I didn't want to be changing slide and send it back and forth. I uh, already have been described the global situation in terms of the, uh, what's happening at the global level in the United States. But in Illinois, as you can see, there has been about 256,677 COVID-19 testing. And uh, that was, this date is about two days ago. We are May 1st. And the positive cases is over 50,000, and the total death is over 2,000. Uh, Chicago specifically ha is responsible for most of the COVID-19 positive cases with over 83,000. And uh, positive cases, about 20,000, and the death, uh, which is very questionable, and I'm going to be discussing that in a minute, is about 851 cases of fatality, unfortunately. In the next slide, this is the concern that we have about the COVID-19 in terms of Latino, but this is also true for African American and for Asian American and for other people of color and for the LGBT and everybody else. There's a serious undercount of cases in fatality and in positive cases because there's poor data collection. When you look at the data, over 34% of the data is missing in the area of race and ethnicity. 
There's misclassification in this case of Latino in the category of white or black or others, although more likely to be in the category of white. And this is, can be very much insulting for some Mexican and some other Latino who feel that white means privilege and they never been entitled to be privileged. They never be entitled to have the benefit of the white European origin population. Cook County Medical Examiner acknowledged that um, in a recent press conference with the president of the Cook County Board, they, he doesn't know how to really classify the racial and the ethnic uh, aspect of the different sort of horns. Because when the Latino is dead, first of all, you know that they die alone in isolation in the hospital. Uh, there's, they, you're not supposed to get close to the body. So even funeral arrangement has been done visually as well. And, and for that matter, it takes uh, two or three weeks for them to do an investigation to be able to determine with a level of certainty of the, uh, of the racial and ethnic uh, background of the individual. We already heard from Dr. Benjamin, this limited testing site in the Latino Barrio, one of the things that we're trying to create through all the media attention is to be able to increase testing. And as a result, we've been fortunate, you know, two days ago, the Norwegian American in Humboldt Park, which is a hotspot area, uh, already started testing. In Cicero, they started testing. And so we're going to continue because the more we get tested, the more likely we're going to find um, positive results in terms of COVID-19. And we need that information because we need to engage in prevention and mitigation and be able to do whatever it takes to be able to stop the spread of the COVID-19 in our community. The other problem that was mentioned earlier is the lack of uniformity and quality of testing kits that may lead to false negatives. One of the things that we want to know, how many people have been tested, how many were positive, how many were negative? Because we've been hearing stories in our community that a lot of people have been tested negatively and they ended up in the hospital a couple of days later. One of the other problems is that private laboratories are not mandated to report results of tests to IDPH, the Illinois Department of Public Health. And therefore, there's a chunk of information that there is not being reported. And there has to be a way of changing some of the administrative or regulatory processes they would let they would mandate those entities and many of them are not reporting because they don't have the electronic system to send that electronically they don't have other support some of those labs in the private sector are small limited staff so there are a number of other issues that need to be addressed as well and now and we already have heard through the media the limitation of medical supplies and protective gears for medical personnel and this is true in our small community hospital, in our community, not only Latino, but also it's true for the African-American and other groups. I'm going to the next slide. So there is lack of consistency in terms of the information about what to do for people that are COVID-19 positive. But before I, I, I elaborate that, I wanted to say that I just found out like two days ago, one day ago, that when you go for testing they ask you for not only your identification and a, and a photo id but they also ask you for your social security number they ask you for your citizenship number and they ask you for cover for health insurance cover and although as it was mentioned before we are now using the resources from the federal government for the testing but the word is not yet out in the latino community that they need to provide that kind of information once they know about it they're going to have this level of distrustfulness, and then I even going to try to be tested because they're, not, they're going to refuse to submit those information, particularly the undocumented, in terms of social security and in terms of the insurance and citizen question. They, all of you know that with the Census Bureau, we had a whole discussion about whether citizenship should be included or not in the Census 2020. So going back to the consistency in terms of the COVID-19 positive, one of the concerns that I have has to do with the federal funds, uh, the federal guidelines about who should go to the hospital. I mean, the reason why, and this also was mentioned briefly, the reason why there's so much death, from my perspective, 
It says the federal guidelines, again, it tells you that you have to be practically dead before you go to the hospital. And so what's happening is that people are practically dead in terms of the advancement of the clinical uh, uh, scenario that they present. And they don't really know if they cannot go to the emergency room and they cannot find a, a doctor if they have one, because most of the doctor in regular practice are not really practicing regularly and may have very limited hours during the week and may not be responsive to any phone calls from what I hear in the community. So what you find is that there has to be some intervention right there. If you are positive, not only give them clear instructions, Instruction about what to do with the device here. I mean, one of the reasons why people ended up having so much difficulty in breathing is because the oxygen level have left. So if we have a kid and give them a thermometer, give them an oxygen device, uh, uh, they, they could be able to start checking because one of the many things that those guidelines say is that you're supposed to check your fever every day. And you're supposed to, you know, make sure that you use home remedy and don't go to the doctor and don't do this and don't do that. And so in reality, our community are not only confused, but they don't know what to do, even if the symptoms are mild or even when they get worse. You hear stories, and the media has covered some of that, that people go multiple times to the hospital, emergency room, before, and they are constantly rejected. I mean, if, if hospitals right now don't say have all the beds full, why is it that they're rejecting people? They could keep them at least one day overnight, one night overnight if they need to, to make sure that whatever the person is saying that is bothering them, they to be checked out. But they are rejected multiple times until they finally leave when they are almost, the guidelines say that you have to have very severe problems breathing, for example. And you know that, that now more information is coming out that people younger, at the age of 20 or even less, may have stroke, may have seizures, may have a series of other conditions that the guidelines doesn't even cover. But the data that is emerging indicated those symptoms. So what I'm saying is that I'm concerned, and I think that the death can be reduced to be able to change some of those regulatory guidelines and make them more appropriate to the different population, because maybe if the way in which the condition manifests in us may be different than the way it manifests on others, and that we demand that we see when they go to the hospital and that they should at least give more attention. And we hear sorry from New York particularly, there's an article that said that if you speak Spanish, then the provider don't want to take the 10 minutes that it takes to call the hotline, the AT&T hotline, and get an interpreter because those are considered valuable moments. That they want that they prefer to spend with others and not to a person who don't speak the language. So there's a lot of, of biases, discrimination that exists. And I think that this whole thing of rejecting our Latinos and our African American that are dying in a higher proportion has to do with the whole fact that they purposely don't want to pay. I mean, I've been advised that, but I really am concerned and I feel that there's more than we could do to avoid the deaths that are happening regarding to the COVID-19. So the guidance is a problem, the lack of bilingual cultural staff, hospital emergency room, and hospital inpatient unit. I heard that the, even with the testing, the testing that you get in the emergency room in terms of the device and the results are different from the one in patient care. And I don't understand why those differences, but anyway, th those are many of the other questions that comes to my mind. Moving then to the next slide. So this is what we found out in April 29, and in many of the articles that you've been in, in TV uh, news that you've been hearing is because for the first time, uh, or, or let me begin, you find that white Europeans are getting more tested, more tested uh, for COVID-19 than the African American and other population. So that's a concern that there's not even equity in terms of those community, and I think that point was raised out earlier. The African American with the new cases, now that we're finally getting more sight in the Latino community, we, the, the data seems to show that there are 61% or 62% of all the new cases of COVID-19 is happening in the Latino communities. 
And about 36% or so, or more than, than the one third, is happening among the African American, which again indicates how the African American and Hispanic, particularly. And you see the cases in, in, in Asian, it looks like kind of low, but you see that in terms of the percentage of total tested, the Asian American is also emerging as a group that we have to uh, be monitoring as well. Unfortunately, when you look at the data, there's only like two cases. I'm an American Indian, Indian American, you know, and, 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 and this data doesn't capture the Middle Eastern European, uh, Middle Eastern uh, groups, um, you know, and many other populations, the like LGBT. And even to get this data, it, it, you know, in the beginning, there was no data. We never, in a month from now, we couldn't know how many tests that were done. How many people, how many Latino were positive, how many are dying? And based on pressure that we've been putting, particularly in the last couple of weeks, we've been finally getting some data and they are admitting, like I said before, the one third are missing value. Um, the next slide. Provina. <laughs> okay, this one basically say what I just mentioned. The other thing I want to highlight is that the Latino may soon become the face of the COVID-19 affected in the in Illinois. And this is very it's sad. It's very sad because our community already hurting in so many different directions. That to have this problem really impacted is proportionally is very, very scary and it's very, very it's hurting. The next slide. These are the communities in the Chicago area, particularly Chicago. We did a geo mapping to find out what are the communities affected the most. So we could be able to develop our strategies in terms of education and prevention and, and mitigation. So you find the number ranking in uh, April 29, two days ago, was the 60639 uh, that covers Chicago, Belmont, Cragen. And most Austin, those community include 80%, uh, I'm sorry, 78% of Latinos, because we were monitoring the Latino percentage, particularly for this slide. And so this is 78% population in those communities, and we ran the highest finding when we start analyzing the data. And you could see how the testing is still low. You know, in general, and the, and the death is now in the ranking based on our computation per 1,000 population. I think that's how we did it. It's medium. So we're going to be starting seeing those death uh, rates uh, coming up. Then you have Salandil. Salandil is La Pequeña Villita. It's the traditional Mexican uh, little village area. And we knew that that area was a problem because when you go to bodegas, when you go to the, to the grocery store, you find the amount of people. You know, uh, uh, together in buying food and, and a laundry mat, at least where the essential workers, which Latino now are essential workers, although in the past we never thought that they were important enough in giving and in doing any meaningful contribution in terms of the labor market. So you, you find that one of the many initiatives is the fact that we need to work, and we are already working through the local chambers of commerce to educate those uh, uh, small businesses about protection, protection of the employee and protection of the client as well. The other community is what we traditionally have reflected to, to the back of the yard, in Pacadora. You also have the Market Park area, and you also have the Chicago Midway Airport uh, area surrounding. Those are Chicago Lounge, and you see, and, and if you, if you've been tracking the, the data from population, which I do periodically because it has implication in terms of political campaign. And when I do political campaign, I want to make sure that I'm going to area helping whoever I'm helping running for office, go to those community with high proportion of, of Latinos so I could be able to impact their potential ability to vote and register and everything else. So you have Cicero, which is, you know, it has like almost 89% of Latino in Cicero. And, and we have actually a meeting with, with Tony Preguesco tomorrow. She's going to be part of our Latino leadership, COVID-19 leadership tomorrow. Then we're going to be addressing her a series of strategies. Waquiga, which have a large Latino population. And the list goes on and on. You see Pilsen ranking eight. And although Pilsen is going through this transformational tra um, gentrification, you still have, they represent 51% of that population there. And so in Chicago, uh, new, new cities, that's the back of the yard, 
uh, again, appears in number 12. And most of the other remaining community, including Humboldt Park, is because they have a mixture of not only a Latino or Puerto Rican, in the case of Humboldt Park, but also African American. So you may find uh, that th those community ranking in the first 15 uh, in the slot of the, of the data. Uh, the next slide, please. And here's basically a map that indicates the same thing in terms of the zip code that are being most affected. And the next slide, please. And, and so going to, to the COVID-19, the economic and social hardship is tremendous. Hispanic-based and national studies are more likely than non-Latinos to see corona, coronavirus as a major threat to health and finance. And this is a picture that was taken in one of the magazine or article that they came out. The next slide, please. Here, a national survey done by, the, by Pew Research Center, that when they asked people in the household a couple of weeks ago how the coronavirus had affected them, uh, Latino 40% said that they had to take a pay cut in their job as a result of the, of the virus. It was 40% versus 27% for the United States representative in that sample. And 29 say at that time that they have been laid off or lost jobs. And this is consistent with a study that was done by this by Hispanic uh, decision. It was presented two days ago this week, actually, it's the whole week that Congressman Garcia have dedicated to COVID-19 in Latino. So every day there is speakers, a panelist talking about the Latino experience. So one of the studies were done in Chicago, the support actually is even higher. The Latino study in, in Chicago on COVID-19 indicated most of the Latino in the study uh, have less than $100 in a saving account or checking account, less than 100. And that was constituted close to 50% of those they were surveyed. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Giacello, you have about three minutes left. Okay, so let me, if that's the case, I don't know what else. Well, the essential worker, I think I made that point. Why don't we move forward to see where I could talk a little bit about uh, the initiative that we have established. Um, and, and the only, this slide here is basically talking about the disparity that already persisted before the cor corona, uh, corona uh, virus, and that is due to institutional racism, social discrimination, and, and other things that affect people of color and that leads to poverty and low paying jobs, and, and et cetera. The next one, I think it talks about the uh, Latino initiative. Okay, so this is what we did. Three weeks ago, exactly April 11, we call a network of Latino leaders representing city, county, and state elected officials in community and health and human services organizations to be able to inform them about what's happening in our community and the trends in terms of the data that we have available with the goal to be able to identify the hotspot area and to prevent and mitigate and stop the spread of the virus. Moving forward to the next one, please. So the objective was to improve data collection. There's a lot of meetings that's taking place about how can we be able to correct some of the problems. You know that at a national level with less economic stimulus, there is a mandate that everybody nationwide, all those they have to standardize the collection of data. And, um, and so this is what, at the state level, I happen to be the chair of the data committee for the Illinois Department of Public Health, Health Equity Task Force. And one of the things that I just presented yesterday in my report during the meeting is that we need to create a, a, a very simple form that includes the kinds of information. So everybody who is, who is filling any form of any type to be able to provide some basic information, not only in terms of social demographic, but subgroup of Latinos being affected, African-American, Asian, uh, all the many groups that we care about, the, dis the disabled population, the LGBT, so we also have been working on a comprehensive bilingual public awareness and outreach campaign that I won't be able to have that much time to, to share. We also launched a, a whole campaign for small businesses through the Shamas of Commerce that I mentioned before. We are advocating for increased COVID-19 testing and screening and trying to get that form that people are supposed to fill out to be changed so it will not include items that may uh, uh, keep our community from getting testing. We're advocating for trained bilingual bicultural staff, uh, and particularly for contact tracing 
several thousand, I, I heard, uh, more than $100,000 or more is coming to every Department of Public Health to engage in contact tracing if we want to stop the spread. So we want our community to be employed to the degree possible because they're bilingual by culture, they know the culture of the community, they are in community-based organization, and they are the ones that are able to be, including the network of community health worker, be able to do a job and help assist. What we want is to partnership with the state and the and at all levels so we could be able to provide support, help, because we are all concerned about the same problem. And, and the mayor's office from the, from the office of the governor, they are overwhelmed with so many issues related to this pandemic. Here it gives you a, a lesson of all the, look at all these state senators that are represented in our coalition, all the state representatives, all the Chicago Oldmen, all the caucuses, actually the caucus already met, at the state level, the Latino caucus with the African American caucus, they already met with the governor uh, last Thursday. Uh, Shui Garcia immediately contacted the mayor of the city of Chicago to see what can we do. And as a result, the city now is providing more data because also the data that I was looking at originally was Cook County that has the best data. The Cook County Department of Public Health, from my perspective. Uh, so we have a number of more than 50 people. Uh, that are part of this coalition. We were able to get Senator Durbin to have a press conference and, and to advocate as many other national organizations to change the uh, the race and ethnicity to have a language preferences as part of any data collection. Um, and so we have been extremely busy just responding to local and national media in English and Spanish about the many different stories that we've been sharing and the many different concerns. We established a bilingual web page that is called IllinoisUnido.com. And so we are putting there all the resources that, that we could find so our community, we're promoting that site so our community could be able to have in one uh, you know, information that they need. And I think there's the last one, um, Ravina. And, and here, obviously, uh, I don't want to, I, don't, I ran out of time, so I'm not going to go into detail, but we want this partnership with the state and the local government and private sector, because we have the trust of our community. We know the language of the community, the culture. We have the necessary infrastructures of operation, because many of our community-based organizations have been there for, for 30, 40 years, so we know how to get things done, and we could do it more effectively in a culturally appropriate in linguistic matter. So yes, here comes, here we are again, you know, our poor communities and community of colors and other voter population are hurting. We are hurting when you hear so many stories. People, uh, because of lack of uh, food insufficiency, the lack of uh, uh, salary. I mean, we are trying now to work with Congressman Garcia, who's now putting a, a, a bill in Congress that is called Health Equity and Accountability Act to make sure that our community, particularly those that are not getting, you know, you, if you have, if you marry and you're married to an, if you're a U.S. citizen and you're married to an undocumented person, you don't get the economic stimulus uh, package of uh, 1200 and, and the aid for your children who are U.S. citizens. So all that needs to be corrected. So he's going to be looking at all that. So I could talk forever for thank you so much and I'm sorry for taking so much time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chiacello. Um, next, we'll have Dr. Murray. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm also uh, want to call out that this is May Day, uh, and this is a Chicago holiday particularly. It's uh, in memory of the so-called Haymarket riots or rebellions here in our, in our hometown. Um, and it is a day for workers. Um, one of the big things that's going on in the news today is that people are talking about when can we get back to normal? Well, I, for one, don't want to get back to normal because normal is not a good thing for people of color. It's not a good thing for people that work in this country. And, and one of the things that's happened with this pandemic is that it's made obvious to lots of people uh, problems and fissures in our society that I think most people attending this conference uh, should know. Um, I'm not going to use any slides. I, I, I hope that uh, after my remarks, we can have some good exchange and, and discussion. I do want to mention one book, and I'm glad uh, uh, Mr. Harrington had a list of books up there. Uh, one book that is a, a public health classic that I think should be required of anybody studying public health. It's the great uh, influenza 
uh, it's about the 1918 influenza pandemic in the United States by John Barry. Uh, it, it's an older book, uh, but I noticed recently that it's made back on the New York bestsellers list. Um, and it's something to remind us that you cannot really understand what's going on today without some sense, some broad sense of, of history. Um, as all the speakers before me have emphasized, if you accept an eco-social model of what causes disease and what allows people to be healthy, then understanding where this pandemic has caused the most harm uh, is not rocket science. And let me say, even though we've been talking about the United States, let me say there are other places in the world where we expect the pandemic to just rifle through populations and cause ridic hundreds of thousands and millions of unnecessary deaths. Certainly the global south is in real uh, danger, particularly overcrowded uh, and poor community uh, nations like India, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the Gaza Strip and the Palestinian encampments uh, where, where it's basically an outdoor prison. We expect these communities to really be ravaged by this pandemic. Um, and even though uh, the population in Chicago and Illinois is relatively small as it is around the country, I want to remind you that we can also predict, based on past experience, where we expect COVID-19 to have devastating effects. We know during H1N1 and also uh, with uh, influenza, but H1N1 is one of our more recent pandemics that the Native American communities on reservations had four times the death rate of white Americans from, from that particular pandemic. So I fully expect to see in our Native American communities, particularly those on reservations, to see uh, really abnormal death rates. I also want to, uh, before I uh, pick up on some of the things that Dr. Giacello said, I also want to remind us that other places in the country that are tracking this by race and ethnicity have different experiences and have different data collection uh, methods. So for example, in New York City, which has and remains the epicenter for the pandemic in the United States, we know that the rates, uh, the age-adjusted death rates by population, not case fatality rates, so remind our students, we don't really know a case fatality rate because we don't know how many cases we have. We don't, we don't know the denominator. We don't know how many people have actually been infected. But in any case, the, the age-adjusted population rates show that Latinx in New York City and Blacks in New York City are almost neck and neck. Um, depending on what day you look at the data, they're very close together. So you don't see the kind of uh, problems we're having here in, in Illinois with data collection. And, and certainly, um, Aida mentioned a bunch of those, so I won't spend a lot of time rediscussing them, except to say that the fact that we don't have a modern data collecting system, not only for pandemics, but also just in general for our health data, is a major problem. Um, and this is what we mean when we talk about the public health infrastructure. If you cannot even count how many people are dying during a pandemic, you got a real problem here. Uh, we don't know how many women get mammograms in this country. There's so many basic public health data that we need to really take care of our people uh, that we don't have. And so spending money on governmental public health and, and beefing up these data systems uh, becomes critical. Um, so where else could we think, or would we predict that we would see problems in our state? Uh, if you look at the map now, and if you, if you remember what's in the news about Georgia and Florida and all these other places that are, quote, opening up, um, you'll understand that we expect the pandemic to spread the way this pandemic has started from our urban areas to our rural communities. And so we still have a few counties in Illinois that have, quote, unquote, zero cases. Uh, in counties where the epidemic is just getting to. But I fully expect, as this pandemic rolls out, to find death rates higher in rural communities than in urban communities. Why? Well, in the United States, there are about 3,000 counties, 3,000 county health departments. Um, and in 15,000 of those counties, about half, there's not one ICU bed. So it doesn't take much, even though the numbers are smaller, say, than in New York City or Chicago, but the rates are much higher. So it doesn't take very many people in a rural county to overwhelm the local hospitals, to uh, not have ICU beds available. And so this is what we see with our seasonal flu data, that the death rates are higher in rural communities compared to urban communities. 
And this is what I expect to see here. So this is what I would challenge everybody at this conference. You all are, even if you haven't graduated yet, you are our nation's experts on public health. And when we talk about a science-based public health, which is not the language I prefer, I prefer a science-informed public health, when we think about being science-informed, we can look at what patterns of disease we see in non-pandemic times. What patterns do we see with infectious diseases, since we're talking about pandemics at the moment, that are similar to the new pandemic? Um, and predict areas like congress settings. So it's not, it's not a mystery to anyone in public health that nursing homes would be an area that would be very vulnerable because of how it's constructed, because people live and work and eat and stay in that setting. Um, it's not unusual to predict that college dormitories and other residential dormitory settings would be a vulnerable place, or that people that are incarcerated would be vulnerable. Um, and so it means on a national level that we should have placed, especially in the days when we had very little testing material, uh, but we should have placed testing uh, equipment in those settings where we expect the pandemic to hit harder, and we should have been prepared to deal with that, because it's in those settings that they serve as petri dishes and allow the infection to continue to spread in the community. I'm particularly infuriated over how we've approached incarcerated populations. Um, in 2019, uh, in the early part of 2019, we had a documented outbreak of 900 plus cases of mumps among people detained by ICE. These are people that have committed no crime. Uh, and are waiting adjudication for their status in this country and that are incarcerated in, a, in an inappropriate and inhumane way that violates basic human rights. And in that population, ICE would arrest people, they would keep them together very, in very close settings, mumps would spread that population, and ICE then dispersed those people throughout the country. They rent jail cells from various local uh, jails, uh, including in the state of Illinois. So we know in Illinois, both in Pulaski County, which is located in the southern part of the county, as well as McHenry County, which is closer here in, in the north, that we had mumps outbreaks. And because those ICE detainees were put in a jail congregate setting, the mumps spread to the guards, they spread to other prisoners, and they spread to the community. And so in a pandemic situation, Having people in Cook County Jail, and we still have about 4,000 people in Cook County Jail at the moment, is a danger to the health of the public. And in Cook County Jail, the vast majority, 90 plus, are not convicted of anything. They're there because they're poor and they cannot make bail. Um, and so when this pandemic first started, uh, the health authorities at Cook County Health argued, tried to get uh, the judges and the court system to release people from the jail because they knew once COVID-19 got in the jail, it would spread and again, it would be a source of problems, not only for staff that work there, but for the communities where those staff live. Unfortunately, um, while four or five, 600 people were released, uh, the judge, the judicial system decided they would look at that case by case, so we still have 4,000 people plus in the jail. And all around the country, we have the similar kinds of problems where once COVID-19 makes it into a congregate setting, it spreads like wildfire. So again, to me, a number of organizations, uh, both public health and civil rights uh, uh, organizations have argued that we should be depopulating these carceral institutions because they represent a danger to the health of the public. And that has yet to really occur. It is a major, major problem and a major area of concern for me. And needless to say, the people who are in Cook County Jail are black and brown and other uh, uh, disadvantaged populations. So that's another area that it's important for us to remember. From a technological point of view for public health, all of our models, and if you all haven't had a chance to look at the models that people are talking about and debating and thinking about how to make policy, take some time and do it. All of these mathematical models are based on ignoring the fact that we have more people incarcerated in the United States than anywhere else in the world, uh, and ignoring the role that incarcerated populations play in spreading 
in a pandemic. So that's another concern of mine as, as the pandemic continues to go forward. Um, secondly, I think that I would encourage you to reconsider and be thoughtful about what we mean by science. Um, I think Dr. Benjamin summarized not only what we presently know about COVID-19, but more importantly, what we don't know. And to really be concerned as a scientist, that's what you're mostly concerned with. You're mostly concerned with areas where you're not sure and we don't know what's going on. And uh, you know, this is a novel virus, so frankly, we hardly know anything. We've only, only been aware of it for a few months. Um, everything from how it presents clinically to what we need to do about it, all the things that George just mentioned. Um, so what we're really concerned about is a way of considering alternatives that's informed by science because science is not a religion. And so there's room for real debate, honest debate, about what should happen next. Uh, there are areas where we have lots of agreement. There are areas where we have less of an agreement. Um, unfortunately, our national leadership doesn't believe in science at all, and so they're not operating with any notion of what sci is scientifically uh, necessary. Um, but for us, as public health people, we do have a clue of what is necessary now. Most people agree that we should have done a lot of testing early. Um, I will only say this, without, you know, no, no country I think is perfect in how it approaches the pandemic. The fact that the CDC unfortunately had trouble with the test, the first test that they developed, put us behind. Um, but in any case, as we go forward, we know what's needed next. And, and I want to talk about that because you all are in the School of Public Health. And I don't think we emphasize it enough in our curriculum. Because we're going back to old school, old style public health. Uh, and even though the words are out there, let's talk about what it really means. So what do we need to do now? What we need to do now is widespread testing. There are different kinds of tests. And right now, I'm not talking about antibody tests. I'm actually talking about presence of infection, current infection right now. And why do you do that? Because you want to do several things, which don't always get explicitly mentioned. If someone tests positive, we want to isolate them, especially since now we're clear that there are many people who are very infectious before they have symptoms, and there appears to be many people who are, have the virus in their system that never get symptoms. So we need to isolate those people so they cannot pass that on. And then we need to do aggressive contact tracing. What does this mean in English? That means we go aggressively and find everyone we can think of who has been in contact with that person who's tested positive. There's a lot of talk um, in the media, et cetera, about <clears throat> computerized digital methods of testing. I'm not against those necessarily, but I want to be clear. In order to do this, it needs a human touch. You have to be able to gain people's trust. You have to be able to work with people and their families so that they don't feel threatened and so that they're cooperative with the process that's going on here. But one person, one 25-year-old person, could easily generate 50, 100, 150 contacts. Uh, early in the epidemic, when we were only contact tracing on people who were sick in the hospital, they easily generated 100 people per each one of those positive hospitalized cases. We do not have enough people working for governmental public health in the United States of America to do adequate contact tracing. We have to somehow recruit and train tens of thousands. ASTO, our, our organization of state public health officials, thinks it's 100,000. I think that's a conservative number. It may easily be 200,000 people who are trained to do contact tracing. And these people can be trained relatively quickly. They should be well paid. They could be community health workers. And I would argue a lot of them should be community health workers coming from the communities where this pandemic is running wild. That means especially uh, black and brown communities, communities of color. Um, and, and we need to have them in place for three to five years if we're going to really address this pandemic. And so that becomes a critical thing that we insist on training of contact tracers in the appropriate languages, and that we insist on hiring people in government jobs with good benefits 
um, in, in a way that they can really strengthen the public health infrastructure. And then the other thing I think we need, so that's just to sort of chase down the virus. And the other thing we need to do is take this opportunity to understand what damage this pandemic is doing to our communities, not only in making people sick and unfortunately having people unnecessarily die, but what it's doing in other areas. For example, there's some 20 million people that have applied for um, unemployment insurance in the recent weeks. Many of those people had health insurance through their job. Now that they're unemployed, they no longer have health insurance through their job. Uh, and we already had a situation in our city where about 20% of black men didn't have health insurance and about 20% of Latino men didn't have health insurance. So to me, if the one thing that we get out of this pandemic, the one reform we can do is have universal health care for everyone, universal medical care for everyone, just because they're living and breathing, regardless of employment status, regardless of immigration status, medical care is a basic human right. And if we can't manage to arrange that after this kind of sad situation with COVID-19, we are in big, big trouble. Other things that the question, your questions brought up are things like housing. Why do we have homeless people in this country? Why is that a lot? Why do we have people, essential workers, and they are really essential, who the ones that have been laid off, say from the restaurant industry, they're getting unemployment now. Their unemployment benefits are more than their normal wages. What does that mean in English? It means their wages were too small to begin with. So we need to readjust our whole notion of what's acceptable. It's not acceptable for people to go to work 40 hours a week and still be poor, not be able to be food secure, not be able to be housing secure, not be able to care for and educate their children. That's unacceptable. And so we need to create a minimum guaranteed income, a minimum wage that allows people to live with dignity. It's unacceptable in this country to have mass incarceration based on the color of your skin or your income. That's, that's not acceptable. We shouldn't commit it anymore. It's not acceptable for us to know who's not getting sick. Not only do we need to capture race and ethnicity data more, we also need to c capture class social economic data. Where are people working? Are we seeing more disease among health workers? That includes people in the janitors in, in the hospital, by the way, among school teachers, among grocery store workers, among restaurant workers. We don't capture that data in our public health uh, infrastructure. And so that means we really are sort of blind as what's going on um, in, in our communities and population. So I have to say that the problems that we're seeing now are not a surprise. And it really requires you, the future generation of our field, to learn the lessons that we should be learning from this pandemic and stand up and demand the changes that we need to make. Let me stop there so we can have some time for questions. I'm looking at the chat to see if there's some things here. Yes, Dr. Murray, there's a Somebody asked about the slides. I'm sure we can make these slides available after this meeting. I'm just assuming that we will be able to do that. Um, I don't know about that. asking also about video. I also don't know about the, the video uh, plan. Let me say something. There's a question here about contact tracers. I want, I want to be clear. Um, there is a role for community-based organizations in general in response to the pandemic. I'm old school. Contact tracing is a core public health function. I think contact tracers that are really doing that need to be hired and paid for by governmental public health. They can work in partnership with CBOs and, and community organizations have a great role to play with increasing awareness and um, increasing information and knowledge. But to really uh, track what's going on, they need the protection of, of governmental public health. Um, so I think what that means is we have to force our, our local health departments and our state health departments around the country to hire people. Uh, you don't need an MPH to be a contact tracer. Uh, you could be just a literate person and, and people can be trained. We do this all over the world. Uh, when we fight Ebola and other diseases in the global south, we take people straight from the village and, and train them how to do contact tracing. So this is clearly possible. And, and I think 
the people that we are presently using as community health workers are a perfect group that could quickly step into uh, this particular skill. They have, they have what's needed. They have trust of the community, knowledge of the community, basic understanding of health questions in general, and they just need some training on contact tracing specifically. I think Prabina may have, are you back, Prabina? I think you lost your mic. I, yes, can yes. you hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, I know Dr. Murray just talked about contact tracing. Yes. Um, there is also another question directed to for uh, Dr. Murray was that if there is a website of the list of political or community leaders in African American community and others of colors that are participating in the planning and strategizing. I think everyone has to do this. I don't. I don't think there's a specific list. As you know, uh, in Chicago, the mayor uh, had had a special rapid response committee that was set up. But don't forget, uh, what about outside of Chicago? What about the, in the southern suburbs, the western suburbs? I don't think people have to wait to be on a list. Um, I think this is something we all have to address. I encourage people, whether they're working with their children's school as PTA or whether they're working in a faith-based organization or in a local organization, sorority, fraternity, to stand up and speak up and, and educate themselves on this issue and begin to work on this issue. This is, this is not going to be over with this year. Okay. Hopefully, we won't be straining our ICUs the way it's going on now in New York City. But this is, and even if there's a vaccine early, it will not be over with quickly. Uh, the people will not get back at work all of a sudden. We're going to lose a lot of small businesses because of this uh, fiasco. Um, and so, unfortunately, this particular crisis, in my opinion, will be with us at least three to five years. And so, we have to stand up and insist on things that address the situation now. And that means making sure that we have funding for our community-based organizations so they can do their work in terms of education and outreach. Make sure that we hire 150, 200,000 uh, public health workers to address contact tracing. And while we're at it, we need to beef up public health in general, have more data people, and many other things that we've lost in the past 20 years in governmental public health. Yeah, this is Joe Harrington. I'd like to pick up on just a few things that uh, Dr. Murray said. Uh, one is that uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, or coronavirus is going to be here. It's not uh, the, the it is not going away. We'll have this for the rest of our lives. Uh, we'll be better able to deal with it and mitigate it moving forward. So people need to be prepared for that reality. The other thing, this is an ideal opportunity for you to get in touch with your elected officials and demand that certain things be done. I think that's what Linda was getting at. There is no list, but if you have an alderman, you should contact your alderman, uh, your locally elected official statewide, uh, your Cook County commissioner, uh, your nationally elected officials, and, and make demands of them in terms of what's happening in your local community. I know we're getting short on time. Let me just make this plea to who, people that are left on this program. It's easy to be overwhelmed by what we're talking about. But with human beings, all problems are complicated. So don't be frightened by the fact that we have a complicated problem here. Um, it is something that can be solved. It's not easy to solve it. It will require national coordination and international coordination uh, to really address this problem in a reasonable way. But as people who have training in public health and are intending to make their careers in public health, you're in a perfect position to give leadership to that training. So do some things that may not sound like fun right now. Read some of those books Joe put up. Read, read some history. Try to understand. Uh, you may be more interested in, in teenage pregnancy, but try to understand what's going on with COVID-19 and how it impacts an area that you have an interest in. And learn how to work together and with other people with other kinds of training, cross-sectorally, education, transportation, you name it, we have to work with them. Because the ability to fight this pandemic depends on you and what you've learned in your education and how you implement the knowledge. Yeah, I just um, want to add that, that activism, you know, I'm, and Linda knows this and Joel, because we work together for the longest time. It is also an opportunity for you to get out of the box and say, well, how can I help my community in whatever way? You hear stories in the media constantly 
of individuals of different age groups that are doing what they can to make sure their food gets to the homes of the elderly, or they go in and help their, their neighbors in you know, doing their shopping for them, or whatever they want to do. The thing is that this is an opportunity of not getting angry, but getting smart. And figure out who can you partner with, whether it's elected officials or other community-based organizations or your neighbors and friends, to be able to see what is the gap, what is missing that is not being addressed, and how can you be able to mobilize and be part of the solution. So I truly believe, and this is what's happening in terms of Latino and Kobe initiative, we came together immediately, we, we sound the alarm, and we're taking step every single day, we take a press release out about any, a particular issue related to the pandemic and keep everybody engaged in both in, 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 in decision and problem solving mode because there are so much. I mean, our community are dying, are hurting. And this is a time that we have to do something about it because I'm a woman of color. I'm hurting too in many different ways, not as, as the other individuals in the barrio, but we are being affected. And so we need to do, get out of our comfort you know, zone and be able to do whatever it takes to particularly to be a part of the solution, to raise the awareness to policymakers, elected officials, and many others that, are, you know, right now, one of the concerns that we're starting to address is philanthropy. You know, the private sector that has the money is not investing in communities of color. So we need to hold about, uh, accountable to them. So this Saturday is going to be represented from the Chicago Community Trust and our visual um, regular meeting and representatives from other entities, they are not really doing what they can to invest in our community and help us now in this moment of crisis. Thank you. Um, the next question is that if there have been any, or there have been some reports of the deaths of Latino identifying individuals have been counted as white. Has the misclassification of Latinos led to higher inflation of cases and or mortality? Well, what happened is that if they are put in the category of white, you are putting in the white data. So the, it's not a true, the, the white, uh, the data, the numbers for white is not as true as it should be. If you have contamination, not only of Latino, but you have a number of individuals from Middle, Middle Eastern countries that are considered white. And now in the, in the sense of 2020, that was one of the many additions that were made. So there are other contamination in the data. And, and, and you know, the Latino is a diverse ethnic group, background, racial group. And as a result, you have the Puerto Rican. We are more likely to be African-American, you know, descent. We are uh, the, the people from the Dominican Republic. So there are a number of Latinos that are actually African origin and that the data may not necessarily classify us appropriately. So the, the, the concern that we have is that we need to improve data for everybody and figure out a way of collecting data for other vulnerable populations, the disability community. We haven't heard about how they've been affected. We haven't heard about the LGBT, although there are uh, uh, leaders that are saying that the LGBT is being disproportionately affected, but we don't, say, we don't have the documentation. And for you to be able to advance the, the agenda in terms of policy and action, you need to have some level of documentation about what are the problems and what are the potential solutions. Going back to contact tracing, I agree with, with Dr. Murray. Yes, you need to train staff, but I believe that a lot of our communities in the African-American and Latino community and others can be trained properly, can be given the opportunity to be part of the solution by being trained to contact, engage in contact tracing and, and learn about confidentiality issues when you know that, that maybe that person that you are following up happened to be your neighbor or your friend or whoever. So it's a lot of things that we could do. I, I certainly, I certainly uh, agree with that, Aida. And, and um, you know, people should be able, we should be able to follow populations like they define themselves so we can make sure that all of our people are being treated appropriately. Let me just say this as a historical fact um, and those that, that we ignore in American history. If you ask yourself, where do most people, who were brought from Africa as slaves in the 15, 16, 1700s, where do they reside and what language in the Americas and what language do they speak? Most descendants of slaves reside in Latin America. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and they speak Portuguese and Spanish. Only about 
four or six percent of the slaves that crossed the ocean ended up in the continental United States. And the other 90-something percent went to Latin America. So when we talk about keeping track of people, we should respect our communities and our culture. We should keep track of people the way they want to be kept track of. And we ought to remember that when we deal with structural racism, we are eliminating these false hierarchies that exist among people based on their accent or the color of their skin or the texture of their hair. So when one thing worse than being seen and stepped on is being invisible and being stepped on. So, so I certainly support our effort to appropriately identify people so that we can make sure that their needs are being met. Okay, so we have another question. It was based off of Dr. Giacello's presentation, but it's open for any of the panelists. It's how was the pay cut slash loss of jobs off um, info collected from the community and has a similar set of data or survey been done in other communities of color? There have been surveys nationally. I've seen some uh, small surveys done in different places, but even before the pandemic, we know what certain industries look like. So, so we know, for example, that Blacks and Latinos aren't very many, are, aren't a big percentage of the position, unfortunately. Uh, and, and we're a big percentage of retail workers, restaurant workers, et cetera. So we know uh, from previous information where, what workforces look like. And so you can tell the industries that have been shut out. For example, look at the meatpacking industry where people are basically being forced to work by the president uh, in situations where it's easy to pass the virus. We know many of those workers are Black and Latino. We know many of them are here without documents. Uh, we've known that for years. And so when we worry about those packing houses, uh, where you all of a sudden have 70 or 80 or 90 percent of the workers COVID positive, uh, that's a major problem, and that and that's because they're working in in inhuman conditions on a good day, and especially when you have a virus spreading around. I'm a research, one of my research assistants left on Friday to Nebraska, where you have the Tyson uh, meat um, packaging uh, company that have, I heard they over 1,000 or more cases of infected individuals. And he had to rush because his father's in the hospital being incubated. And then his mother in his house in Nebraska uh, is also infected and two young brothers and, and sisters. So, you know, it really is, you are correct. The majority are immigrants, they're Latinos, and they're living, they are working in humane conditions. And and the, and the uh, go, you know the government starting with the White House were the ones who put an executive order to, to go back to work because they don't want any scarcity of meat. All right. Well, we do have a couple more questions, but unfortunately, it looks like we have gone over time. So I just want to thank everyone. Um, I didn't properly introduce myself earlier, but my name is Marina Takwanwe, and I'm an undergraduate student at UIC School of Public Health. I'm also one of the conference coordinators. At this time, I'd like to thank all of our panelists and especially Dr. Benjamin, who I know isn't with us at the moment. But thank you to Mr. Harrington, Dr. Giacello, and Dr. Murray. Um, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us and discussing these very real and pressing issues that are affecting our communities. We'd like to say thank you to all of you as well, our participants for being so patient and understanding. We appreciate all of you because without you, we wouldn't be able to have this great conference. And finally, we'd like to thank our IT support for everything they've done for us. Um, so from all of us at the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and Minority Health Conference team, we extend our more sincere thanks and gratitude.